This is Colonia Cast, episode 26. You can find us at the turtleroom.org slash coloniacast, where you can learn more about our program and access the Colonia Cast Student Research Fund. Today we are joined by Terrence Rogers, who is uh, you may recognize from one of our our earliest episodes. I think it was episode four when we had Terrence and Andrew on, as well as John Can, who is the authority on Australian turtles. Uh, and, and we're really excited to talk to uh, John and Terrence today just about some of the adventures that both of them have had and some of the amazing sort of the keelids and, and some of the other species that, that are within Australia and some of the adventures too, you know, that there's a lot of really cool things. John is also the author of the Freshwater Turtles of Australia, multiple editions, uh, the most recent, I believe, 2017. So definitely go and pick that 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 uh, book up if you haven't already it's one of the best uh turtle and one of the best books really you can get on on turtles and uh beautifully illustrated and lots of great information so we're really excited to talk to uh you today john and terrence thanks for coming on no worries i have you guys all right so um for the first question we, we ask this for everybody it's just you know like an icebreaker uh, what got you interested in turtles, and where did your career in reptiles begin for both of you? Where did I start with turtles? Well, my dad was a snake man, professional snake man. He was a showman, traveled the showgrounds. So did mum. Uh, they teamed up together years ago and ended up getting married. <coughs> uh, but he ended up he gave away the show showgrounds a lot. And he, he worked at uh, Taronga Park Zoo. He was curator of reptiles there for 20 odd years before he retired. And uh, I was regularly at Taronga Park Zoo and he was getting a lot of turtles there in big ponds that used to be sent by various people. And, and I was only a kid, about 10, 12 year old or less. And uh, dad didn't know what they were. And neither did uh, uh, anyone else, really. That No one knew anything about turtles. There's a few books about them, about the common ones. But uh, And I was always a diver uh, all my life. And, and then when I um, wasn't spearfishing, I was trying to find rivers. And I used to bring home turtles, and, and I didn't know hell what they were, so I... I'd take them to uh, Eric Worrell, the reptile park, or Hal Cogger, and uh, they weren't real sure what they were either. So that's where my interest started, to try to track them down and work out what they were and what was new. So as you probably you know, I, I, I started naming a few turtles. <clears throat> I didn't even know what genetics was. There was genetics wasn't even out at the time. Um, there and then along come genetics and and um, of all the ones I described, I consider them all species uh, or subspecies. Unfortunately, uh, other people are thinking different. They uh, only believe in genetics, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of these so-called professionals, they uh, they. Um, wouldn't know the difference between a long neck or a short neck unless they did genetics. They're, they're, they don't believe in any morphological difference. They can't tell the difference. They all look the same. One professional was hired uh, by another professional, uh, a chap, um, to go and check all my subspecies or, along the coast of New South Wales. And he came back and he said, they're all the same. He's got to be joking. He couldn't tell the difference. And uh, when they end up doing genetics, they were different. But only a very slightly a bit. But they're more so different in morphological uh, sightings. You, know, you can pick it very easy with that they're a different turtle for different reasons with the number of eggs, the size of the eggs, the hatchlings in particular are so different. And um, they're still lumping them all in as Macquarie. And uh, that's criminal, in my opinion, because um, they're going to lump them all in together and, and they don't mind if they mix up or anything. They're, 
they're just beating evolution. That's what it is. These things are a different turtle. And it's much the same right throughout Australia. Uh, a lot of there's that many turtles undescribed in Australia. Um, I don't know when they'll all be described. It won't be by me or some of my friends, which are doing a little bit. They're they're knocking back our one of our magazines, the Batica, um, Ross Gurley, um, and it's everything is done in a scientific manner. Um, following all the rules to make it being classed as a scientific uh, magazine, but they're knocking them back because they've now barred the Batica um, from being a scientific magazine. Well, that's criminal. So. That, no, yeah. I mean, it, it's tough sometimes. And say, Australia in particular has had sort of a turbulent taxonomic history. It, I think that kind of an interesting scenario there in particular a lot of the turtles and such but that, that's interesting to think and i know russ pretty well and and uh the badiger and and there's some really great information in there so uh just kind of a an interesting perspective there maybe we could talk a little too about uh the freshwater turtles of australia um that really a large compendium of information on and and a really holistic review of, of a good number of every species in australia i guess um what did it take sort of to to compile all that information where did you go to get that that information and 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 what what were some of the interesting things you learned kind of in the process well, of I, I had a pretty good job at the time uh for many years i was working on power line construction and sometimes between uh, between jobs or extensions of where the lines were going to go on the power lines all over New South Wales sometimes there was nothing to do but travel the country with a land cruiser and uh, look for turtles mm -hmm. so I spent most of my many many years chasing turtles and photographing them and and getting permits to bring some home and have a look at. And uh, so that's that's where I spent most of my time, hunting them. I had a lot of friends who used to photograph turtles for me uh, on properties um, or traveling through the country and they'd send me photographs of the turtles. And I, if I, they looked interesting, I would go for a drive. It might be, well, driving around Australia alone, that uh, was about 30,000 k's, um, which is a long way. Although you blokes don't speak English very good, you talk about miles. And <laughs> it does help a little bit, but uh, it's a lot of traveling. And uh, we find a lot of animals there. You know, I spent all my time diving. Right, uh, yeah. And I, I'm curious, in some of the pictures in, in the freshwater turtles of Australia, how did you get some of those? Because they're all really, really nicely done. And it just kind of how did that happen, I guess? Well, the ones in the water, the tank, was a good friend of mine, <clears throat> a good fish man, Gunther Schmitter, who passed recently. Um, he was cheated out uh, quite young and um with a problem but uh he he gave me some clues about how to photograph in tanks and nearly all my good shots of swimming turtles were done in big aquariums i had um actually bill mccord one time he flew me over to the uh to new york out of new york where he was um in the bush and uh and um I give him the dimensions of the tanks, uh, the big tanks to set them up. And I come over there and he had a lot of turtles from New Guinea. And that's where I was photographing them. Although I'd been to Western New Guinea and used to photograph turtles there, but not in aquariums, just ups and down shots. And they was obviously an undescribed turtles. There's a lot of them there in New Guinea and there's probably, well, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be exaggerating. There'd be 
15 or 16 undescribed ones in Australia. That'd be conservative sort of an estimate. That that's interesting. Maybe we can talk a little more too about some of your adventures, I guess, outside of Australia in, in New Guinea in particular. I, there's been sort of in the past 20 years or so, a, a fair amount of species coming out of New Guinea and, and, and sort of cryptic taxa. And just, it seems like there's sort of a paucity of, of research in that area. What was it like to go there and, and what species were you looking for when you were there and, and kind of what did you learn? There's a, kind of an interesting assemblage of turtles there. Well, when I, when I went to New Guinea, the, the first time was Western New Guinea, Erie and Barat, they call it at the time, Erie and Jay and Al, or Papua. Um, I was on there after turtles. Uh, a friend um, from New Guinea himself, Port Moresby, uh, invited me to go with him for six weeks um, looking for wildlife for American zoos. He had permits for all the zoos um, to get them transferred over or get permission to have them. Um, we couldn't go to uh, Papua New Guinea. We had to go to West Area, um, where no one had really ever been there. So we went there for six months, for six weeks, and I ended up coming back six months later. <clears throat> they thought I was gone, and my family thought we was finished with the cannibals was there were a few uh cranky natives there but we got on pretty good to them and and um i come across i was always looking for turtles but the rivers were too dirty to dive i dived there but i was only diving there to catch freshwater crocodiles <coughs> excuse me coughing i haven't got the bug i just got a bad throat and no one can work out why i cough but anyway, I used to dive in the dirty rivers there to, to catch um, to catch freshwater crocodiles for the zoos, um, which was always a risky business because there was the river was alive with salties, and we've seen many, many of them. So that was a bit scary. That's a little bit worrisome. <laughs> yeah, but uh, how many turtles? I found a lot of. Oh, sorry, things tree specialists, and I don't know why I cough. <coughs> um, but anyways, no worries. Uh, the, a few, the, the few of the turtles I've I found there, though I know they're still undescribed, and um, a few of them have been recently described. Some in the Batiga, which is causing a bit of a problem, but uh, we hopefully will overcome that. Uh, uh, problem in the future. We've got a few ideas how to beat them um, about not being a scientific magazine, which it most certainly is. Right. That well, that's in, there was. I remember too in the back of uh, the Turtles of Australia. There's a list of three Chelidina species that are undescribed, and it says they're kind of from different areas. But that was particularly interesting because you can see morphologically that sort of differences and i noticed one of them has kind of a longer snout than the others and 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 that's something that's pretty consistent you said so you've seen a lot of variability across yeah. that range and yeah well things are getting a bit hard now to, you've got to get permits uh to get into the into the country and uh into the states i should say and, and then you've got to go through a lot of rigmarole to get someone to do the dna I've got no excess for people doing DNA with me, although I can look at a turtle and I'll know if it's a new species or not. But just describing it today, they want genetics to be done, you know. Right. Yeah, there's definitely sort of with technology. And stuff. You take a water there. Oh, yeah, no water. problem. No, nope. you're, you're all good. <laughs> but um, I, so. That's that's interesting to hear that sort of the travels to New Guinea, and there's a, so I guess Australia proper, maybe Northern Australia and the, the Northern Territory, Queensland, the Kimberley regions, that that whole area. You've done sort of exploring up there. What what sort of things have you looked for in, in that area? Maybe some of the, in particular, the Dolly River is uh, I think at least eight species of, of uh, turtle well, in that one area. 
in those areas, you sort of know what you, you're expecting you're going to see. Sometimes you get a bit of base, but the rhythm Tata group, the snapper group, um, or the Elsaia group, as I call them. Um, I think George's has changed the names from Elsaia now to Maya Shelley's with the latter sternum group, but uh, um, our name went first or another name went first by Wells, but they override him all the time. But regardless of what the name is or really even the genus is, there's quite a few different ones. And often you bring them out and you know straight away that they're, they're a different turtle. And um, I was speaking to Arthur Georges there a few few months ago and, and I said, I believe you're working on um, the Elsaia. I said, I was considering looking at them, you know. I said, I know five different species. He said, well, uh, he said, I've got genetics of six different species, you know, which was interesting. So that's jobs that he's got to arrange himself down the track or one of his students or one of his other friends, maybe Scott Thompson, I don't know. So I, 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 I decided to give the latter sternum group a miss, you know, and just stop, stay on the uh, dentata group or whatever to do my research. So get, you know, I'm 84 now and I don't travel so much. Um, it's a bit hard to get away. I, I've got rid of my cruise. cruise. I went this um, bug come into the country from from uh, from China. Um, I just had my land cruiser sitting still, kicking the motor over to give it a run every now and again for for over two years, and never even went on the road virtually. So I, I sold it. So why keep it? You know. So I won't be doing any more long trips after turtles, although I've got a terrible lot of photographs and um, I'm sending them to others and let them worry about it. And I give it, I keep a pretty good record of the sizes and eggs and everything else. So they take it from there. That's interesting. You mentioned the the Maya Kellys or the the Wollumbinias, right? That's kind of again the naming is sort of all over the place. But I don't know if you know because in the in your book you mentioned the the um, the Bellinger River snappers that were having kind of an issue with lesions and such. I don't know if you know what the the most recent kind of update with that is. Well, they're uh, starting they, breeding them all right in captivity now. The Bellingham River. They <clears throat> they've changed the name of that. I don't know why George's George's. I call it George's Eye. And Arthur was pretty um, pleased to think that I named it after him. Um, but he hates George's as turtle. So uh, as far as I was concerned, the author of a turtle names it the common name as well. It's always been the case. It's George's turtles, Stein Duckner's turtles. You look it through the book or through the list. The author has named the turtle what his common name is to. And um, there's probably 30 odd different names named after people, Crests and Stein Duckner and, and all those, you know. Well, Arthur didn't like George's turtle, so he called it a snapper. Well, the Belgian River is, is not a snapper. It's a very placid turtle. If you poke it in the mouth and out again, he'll bite you. Well, that's your problem. But uh, the snappers are snappers. They're dentata group. They're um, a ladder sternum or Maya Shelley's as they want to call them. It's, it names nothing to me. But um, oh, yeah, of yeah. late, of late, the the they seem to be doing all right in the wild. I've heard from a friend up there that the the wild ones are pretty happy. Um, there's um, the ones they're breeding at the zoo are, are, are doing all right as well. They they seem to be breeding quite a few. Um, have you heard much from the zoo? No, not too much. I know yeah. they're starting to release a few. That's yeah. great. I think they'll pick up. But it was very touch and go there for a while. Yeah. 
All right. Well, that's good to hear. That's neat. That they, do you know if they'd isolated any sort of pathogen or if they know it was causing that or is it kind of still? They've, they have identified, they have identified a virus um, and they call it the Bellinger River virus um, or BRV for short. Um, but how much they know about it, I haven't fully read that paper, um, but how much they fully know about it and how similar it is to other viruses, I'm not completely sure. Um, but um, yeah, there's, there's always, you know, there's always a fear that it might come back. So um, I don't think they really know how the event happened or what caused the event. So, you know, if it, if there's some sort of trigger that it's without an understanding, it's, it might just happen. Um, hope not though. <laughs> right. That, okay. That, well, that's good to hear that the situation is, is, uh, seems to be resolving. It's not something that's continuing, but a bit worrisome, I guess, that we don't know what's causing it exactly. But, yeah. uh, well, one thing too, that you mentioned, John, is the naming of turtles, right? That, that a lot of people will get turtles named after them. And then there is a Keladina cani as well. And that, that's a interesting, uh, species. I'm curious, sort of, what what is the sort of ecological history of that species and the natural history? I'm sure that you've gone on trips to go and find them. What what were those like, and what what's it? Well, I they're, guess, what they're not a real to... common turtle. They're not a real common. <clears throat> I, I haven't. Uh, I found a few from location location um, where they are. They're pretty widespread. Um, but only people who are finding them are only finding a few in the waterway, you know. Well, it's interesting, one turtle that's in my book there, or might have been in my earlier book the uh, uh, I did before that, um, where I caught this, what I considered a new species of turtle. I've never seen anything like it before. <clears throat> and... Um, Arthur George just did some genetics on it, and uh, he said it's a hybrid between Shilladina rigosa, which is um, is now Shira Shiraponga, and um, and and can I? You couldn't imagine his two genetically distinct turtles. One grows monstrously large; the other's a smaller one, and they're hybriding. And they're in a certain location in the Gregory River. Um, I was in the pros of describing it when Arthur found out that it was a hybrid, you know. So uh, that was, but a few of our turtles are crossbreeding. Another one that I found, um, what I call Rankin's turtle still, although others call it Can I, um, in a different location. Um, Rankin's turtle is crossing with Longicollis, a very similar sort of a turtle, and they're very unusual. They're a hybrid as well, um, but they're restricted to a certain region. They're not all over the country. There's a, where the uh, canine, the Rankin's turtle, <coughs> which has been killed now by by the genetic uh, people, but I don't think they've checked, the, checked it correctly myself from to get from where the original one come from the Burdigan River near the Burdigan River but, uh, you said they're not very common do we know why that is is that no I, well it could be for a major reason nobody has really worked uh, a real lot about them so so far the distance I won't be going up that far anymore you know it's I'm too old and worry about traveling, getting talking somebody into taking me for a long drive or going with me um, uh, anymore. But uh, I don't know why they're in smaller numbers because the common long neck longicollis, they're in pretty big numbers um, in many lagoons and locations you go to. You can find 20, 30 or 40 or 50 in a short period of time. Um, whereas you go to look for can I, you're lucky to find one. There's a, 
one or two locations where the holotype come from. Um, there was maybe four or five found there. Um, that's in a dam, but in the rivers, it's hard to come across it. So I don't know why the numbers are so uh, so small. I think it could be just lack of work um, of trying to track them down. Interesting. In there's so there there's St. Patrick. They co-occur with the the um, I guess Rugosa and the, in the north, and then the Longicaldus in the in the southern portion. Is that? How, how do you mean the Rugosa in the north? Do they live together with the Canai. They live. The, they live together with the Canai. Yes, but don't. <coughs> but I um, and they're breeding together too. Okay, so they are so they're not, yeah, they're in... yeah. And just recently, uh, a friend sent me some photographs. He was camping, not a turtle bloke, and there was a, a turtle running along a bank, and he photographed it. And sure enough, it looked like a pure canine to me in this location where the cross one was. Because um, uh, I only ever, any that I found were a hybrid, not the real attractive one. Um, was a mixture of the of, of the of the two turtles, and I've never ever seen a regosa there, as we call it now, as we used to call it regosa. They were never seen there in that waterway. Uh, I found them in the main river, the Gilbert River, maybe hundreds of kil kilometres away in lagoons. Yes, but uh, never found it in that water hole, and I dived there in dirty water catching them by feeling that's all you know way you couldn't catch and dive and see them the water was always dirty and um it wasn't very deep it was about six foot at the deepest and um you'd bump into them now and again i have caught a couple in the in the, in the traps but never have i found a ragosa and never had i ever actually caught a can I there, but the hybrid was there. That must have been going for a million years. You wouldn't know. That's interesting. So, and when you're doing these trips, are there, kind of in the northern region, I don't know, are there a lot of protected areas in the range of, of the can I, or are these just kind of public areas and, and that you're finding them, or, or do they have? Oh, I'll, I'll go anywhere. I uh, go cross country all the time. I don't go on the highways. I do go on the highways with my land cruiser. I can, I used to take it in ridiculous places, you know, or get permission from property owners to, to go in. And it was always very interesting, but uh, there's no trouble finding turtles if the water's clear, because I always dive. I very rarely use, I only ever use a trap if it's, uh, maybe I put the occasional trap in at the night time. Um, a lot of my traps have been destroyed by saltwater crocodiles. I know that, but uh, it's always a threat. Right. And, I was going to ask, what is it like diving in? Uh, in am, I, am I good? Am I good? Like, the audio. You have to ask, Scoot is, the other uh, direction. What's that? Does that work? You're good. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Yeah, there uh, we what go. Is like, what is it like diving in uh, waterways that that are full of saltwater crocodiles? Or, I mean, most I've ever done anywhere near that is with alligators, but that's that's not even in the same magnitude of, of like that. What's it like diving? Well, I have dived where there's salties there. <clears throat> I've got photographs, but chiefly I'd, I'd go to the rivers and I'd. I'd, I'd ask the rangers, I might be, I might find a ranger somewhere, which is very, very rare. Are there any salties here? And they said, oh, we check this river every two or three days and we don't see nothing with the lights of a night time, you know. That makes me feel real confident, I don't think. Um, I went to another place where I, I dived in, in in Western Australia and I got permission from the property lady. I said, I want to dive for turtles. She said, oh, that's a bit risky. She said, there's a lot of crocodiles here. But she said, she, if you go up a little bit, go back about 15 miles, 
um, to where the homestead is. Um, there's a concrete crossing across there. Uh, we wash, the, the cattle men wash there, uh, but don't go on the left hand downstream side because the saltwater crocodiles are there. But on the other side, she said it could be pretty safe if you're careful. But it's good to know the crocodile wouldn't walk 10 yards across the concrete <laughs> crocodile. So I had a dive there and there was two turtles I wanted for my uh, my earlier book, um, Freshwater Turtles of Australia, not the New Guinea one. And um, I took a risk there because there was two turtles I really wanted. One was Victoria and the other one was um, Dantara where the hollow types originally come from into that creek that went out in the river anyway uh i was very lucky the water was quite dirty but looking up amongst the pandanus leaves and and branches i i caught the two turtles i wanted um very quick maybe within half an hour i thought i've uh, seen the water was quite dirty so I said to myself, time to get out the water, you know. So I, I climbed out the water and I'd been upstream a fair bit by then and I walked back on the safety side. And my wife's got a video, she's still got it. Uh, this is back in 1990. And uh, Helen's got the video going. She's saying, I don't know where John's is. Um, there's a lot of crocodiles here. I hope he's okay. I snuck up on and grabbed her. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was a risky dive, you know. Yeah. And I often check the banks to look for tracks. If you find a good sandy patch, you know you're not going to go in there because you've got crocodile tracks everywhere, you know. But it's always a risk, particularly when I was in New Guinea. That was I. I no amount of money could pay me to dive where I died early in the rivers there, over the Friendship River, <coughs> as we call it, uh, as it was called at the time. But, yeah. That's and, interesting. You, that you mentioned the rivers in uh, New York, I've heard about it before. Are they all like more turbid than the rivers in uh, Northern Australia? Like in general? Oh, uh, in when I was in New Guinea, the water was always dirty except one place, Cora Cora Creek. That means Turtle Creek. Uh, up at Nabri, that was good clear water. Uh, it was only a short stream and come up the mountains, it was all right. But everywhere else, the water was very dirty. There, we was catching them, buying them off the markets. Sometimes we go into a village there at Nabri or somewhere, and they'd be selling turtles and. Oops definitely undescribed stuff you know so i didn't do a real lot of turtle hunting in west new guinea because we was after any sort of animals tree kangaroos and and birds etc we was paying the natives and i was setting traps for us and getting some tobacco rothers or whatnot you know um but there wasn't a real lot of turtle hunting You've, so you've had run-ins, well, I guess avoided run-ins with the crocodiles, but sometimes the people that are in these areas can be a little kind of scary too sometimes. You never know what they're going to be doing. Have you had any kind of run-ins with, with people around the river or anything that was kind of scary in, in searching for turtles? Well, <clears throat> I was up the river there one time and was a bit concerned. I I did get a bit of a shock. We was camped on a big sandbar <clears throat> and we had two native or three native guides with us uh, one was an interpreter we hired me and my mate um, to liaise with the natives because he could speak pretty good indonesian or that and broken native talk and um, next thing one of these natives and his mate jumped up with him with their bows and arrows we looked like we was about, we're starting to run. We thought we was being attacked by a, a wild tribe where Rockefeller got the chop. And uh, it turned out all they was doing, they was shooting with their bow and arrows to uh, bring down the bats. 
where the, which they was eating, you know. Anyway, he's, he's put a spear through this bat with his bow and it fell in the water. So I run down in the water to get it out and save his arrow for him because it was still stuck in it. And they charged after me and tackled me, chased me, stopped me from going in the water because the, the bats always f fly, they, they explained to us, in the same area and they spy it fly low. And sometimes they drop in the water or they sleep in that tree and they drop in the water and that's where the crocodiles live. So you don't ever go in where the bats are. The bats oh. often fly in the trees, yeah. I get, uh, all right, so that's like a two for two there. The the, the people, but I guess they sort of, they might have saved you there, but it, it, that's an interesting one for sure. Yeah. How about like working with uh, the Aboriginal people and, and different even tribes in, in New Guinea and Australia? It, what can you learn about the turtles from, from that kind of work? Well, I don't really mix with the Aboriginal uh, people that much when you go bush. You often, occasionally you come across a few of them and you talk about them and they say a few things, you know. Um, the only thing they're interested in in uh, in turtles are uh, was for food more or less in the in the in the country there. Actually, um, five of my grandchildren or great grandchildren are Aboriginal, part Aboriginal. You know, uh, they wouldn't eat a turtle. It's only the natives in the bush where they eat an awful lot if they can get them. You know, but. Uh, in New Guinea, the, the, they used to catch pig nose for us because um, we, we used to give them a dollar each for those. And the missionary, uh, Jim Fraser, who was in charge of the mission where we were, um, he, he, he said, stop paying them money for, for a dollar. He said, that's causing inflation. <laughs> First of all, I virtually heard of the word. <laughs> giving them a dollar each for a, a, a small pig nose. And strange enough, they went back to America back, that's back a long time ago, 1972. Um, Bill McCord has still got a one there about a big now. He brought from another chap who uh, sold it when they, from the zoo. So Bill McCord has actually still got one of those turtles from 1972. Yeah. Wow. And so you've done the Coretta Kellys, you've also looked for them in Northern Australia and, and even sort of have been in like snorkeling for them. What can you, do you actually, how many were you, were you finding out there when you would go snorkel for them and, and uh, what are they feeding out there? Huh? Yeah, well, we used to get a few when we was diving. Uh, not a real lot, but we always get a number of them. And I've been out there <coughs> since then maybe about six years, five years ago, um, a chap had permits to catch a few from the government and uh, in West, in, 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 in the Northern Territory. And we would have counted 20 or 30 pig nose, I would say, without any trouble at all in clear water in the Daly River. So there's quite a few of them still around. There's no doubt about that. But... Uh, uh do you where are they sort of i know there's been some controversy over their distribution in australia in particular they're in the dolly and then are they in any other major rivers well, the reckon there's one's been reported from the victoria river um whether that was factual or not i don't know it's very it's a long way away from the daily river for a water turtle to to travel so he would not have but um, no one else has ever seen them. So they've been restricted there. There's a couple of other little close by rivers. Uh, the pig nose are there, most certainly, you know. Um, the alligator, the east and south alligator, there's pig nose in a few of those locations. But they're not in, in big numbers in those areas. Not that, not that anyone's done a lot of work that I know of. Um, the water's very dirty. 
But the Derby River at times is quite clear and you can see them very easy. Are there any main differences between the PNG and Aussie one? Well, the PNG one grows bigger, um, most certainly a lot bigger, and they do have salt extracting glands, which the Australian one doesn't have. So whether that calls it a new species, actually Richard Wells years ago um, named the Australian one as a subspecies from the original one which did come from New Guinea and um, and then years ago they found out they're in Australia as well but uh, it's been ignored that name that he used anyway but, interesting yeah so I, uh, in I, cut out for a I cut out for a second but I imagine uh, you're about the Coretta Kelly's or the Pygmus turtles yeah how much yep larger are in New, in New Guinea compared to the ones from Australia then like how much bigger are what how, much, bumble? how much bigger are the Ameri other uh, ones probably probably 30 centimeters longer I've seen photographs of one which was a monstrously large turtle was on a documentary I just couldn't believe it but I could never ever get a photograph off the chap that did originally uh, catch it and photograph it. It was a big turtle. It was almost twice the size of any that uh, I've ever seen in the mainland of Australia. I think there are maximum sizes around about, you know, so much, but it doesn't compare with uh, the big New Guinea ones, which used to be found there, but they're eating thousands of them now. And, um, taking them back to the markets in uh, in Asia or different places. I've got photographs sent to me from a chap in Western New Guinea, of all things. Still made contact with him through a friend. And uh, I would say I would have two or 3,000 baby pig-nosed turtles. I'm only talking about two months, uh, three, six months ago. Two or 3,000 easy in pens where they've um, incubated the eggs. I've got pictures of the eggs being incubated uh, in these big uh, sh shed they build up in where the sand are, where, where they bury the eggs, and they're sent to Asia. So, it's the, you know, the natives are just really, really into them to, for money, not so much for food. They're just after them. The Indonesians are, let's say the natives catch them for them, but uh, it's the Indonesians that are running the show. Thousands of them. Right. It's any photographs. Uh, would you say that in New Guinea, it's possible they used to get more than 60 centimeters in parapet's length? It kind of sounds like that, that you're uh, implying that they were, they were massive. Like, like Could you get that? over 60 centimeters do you reckon over 60 oh yeah they're, they're sent they're sending them to the markets they're only only about you know what's that 10 centimeters six seven centimeters seven centimeters yeah but the big ones that that big one you were talking about would it have been bigger than 60 centimeters he would have been about yeah, that yeah about yeah. that yeah wow. <clears throat> yeah i never got a photograph of him unfortunately the right. chap promised me he would um and i i did photograph his documentary on channel seven had it and um i got all the footage from somebody at channel seven and uh i said photograph the turtle that's been put up on the bank out of the water and they did the wrong photograph they did the a different photograph altogether so I never had the now to ask them again you know because yeah. they wanted to charge big money but we slipped we got that out of that but oh, so i never ever got a photograph of that big turtle but it's a big one it's in a documentary and the chap said he'd send me a, a photograph but he never ever did his shifting houses and he said i don't know where they are at present you know 
but they would be that big, yeah. big turtle. What's the reasoning behind why they would get bigger? Size of it down anyway. Yeah. Why do you have any sort of hypothesis behind why they get bigger in, in New Guinea versus in Australia? Are they on the beaches more like sea turtles or well they they nest in the salt water. They nest in the salt water. Our ones they they nest there and the tide goes over them. Um where our ones the Australian ones, they nest up on the bank where the flood waters won't come. But when the waters do rise in the wet season, that usually breaks the egg open. Help, they know there's water there and they they head back to the river, the Daly River, or wherever they are. But as I say, the ones in in um, in West Irian, they nest the same way up in the sand. But I found out paper by one of George's uh, workers years ago that uh, they're nesting under the salt water. Huh, maybe there's some selection for larger eggs. It helps with dealing with that, the conditions of the salt water more efficiently than smaller yeah. eggs. And then, Yeah, well, genetically, they they reckon they're the same, but strike as, as far as morphological goes in size is an isolation. And the, and, the, and the salt extracting glands. I had one a small one one time in a in a tank and it was getting a little bit of fungus on his body and what the normal thing was to do always is put a bit of salt in the water. It helps clean them up. And the next morning <coughs> my one was dead. The salt would kill him. So that's one of the Australian ones. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Well, the, the Coretichel is... Uh, eh? Well, the, they're interesting turtles for sure. I think that, that there's... It's, yeah. it's interesting to hear there's differences like uh, as drastic as the lacrimal glands being present in one versus absent in another. I, I think that that's something that, that's unique for sure. Maybe we can switch over to talking about something that's that's uh the the elsaia the specifically erwin i i know that you played a role in describing this species um and maybe even we're in connection with the erwin family i guess but what was sort of what, what what was the process there what was it like to discover that that turtle well um steve's father caught me one bob he caught one on a fishing line Sorry about that. Sorry. And uh, on a fishing line, and uh, they sent me a photograph, and I could see, wow, this is something different. So I went up there and and uh, had no trouble after a couple of dives of, of finding them in big numbers there, you know. They're a beautiful turtle. They're very genetically close to uh, one that they're knocked back sterling eye genetically close same as the one from the dane tree um they're very close as well but they're all uh, classed as subspecies um correctly would be the word you know although uh the chap that was gonna describe them believe you me it's been six or seven years and he hasn't done it he works at a university or worked at a university and does surveys now, but seven years, someone should jump in and do the descriptions on those turtles rather than leave them sit like that for two years. They're, they're killing sterlings. I reckon sterlings is, is a good subspecies to Earl and I because Earl and I was first, you know. Was, um, did you, did you help? with field work like collecting the holotype of the Irwin eye or yeah you know, i who? collected in the in the vertical level turtle Irwin's turtle they're in reasonably good numbers way up the river they're talking about building a big dam up there which is a problem um so we just got to see this the chaps are working on it though and yeah they're really a beautiful turtle and they're in pretty 
pretty established numbers, but you never know what dams do. I I hate dams as far as turtles go, yeah. because uh, well, there's an Irwin's turtle shell there. Yeah. Oh wow. You see it there? That's amazing. Yeah. We, well, and actually, we've done some work in the in Peter Pritchard's the Colonial Research Institute collection. He's got a skull that I think you sent to him. Is that the the shell that that animal came from, or? I'm not sure. I give Peter a few a few shells here or there, and a few skulls over the years. You know, not for many many years, but uh, I'm not sure which one you're referring to offhand, you know. Great guy, Peter. Went to Galapagos with him and uh, we had a great trip. He camped at my place one time early in the piece, went bush and he did some photographing. He was doing a book on turtles of the world, but uh, I never eventuated, unfortunately. Oh, he had another one that was set up, huh? Yeah. Interesting. Well, that but that's interesting. So, that I guess it was uh, with the Irwin's turtle. The dam is yeah. That's probably not going to be a good thing. But all the uh, predators, right? Like subsidized predators, foxes, raccoons. Are those sort of an issue as well for nesting turtles? Well, yeah, there are a lot of. They've been surviving for a thousand years, but since the, there's not that many foxes up there in, in, in that area that I know of. There's an occasional fox track. But um, predators, well, that's the introduced one. The dingoes would have dug a few up. A goanna is one of the main killers of, of, of uh, them also. And as um, Andrew and <coughs> Terence <coughs> mentioned to me earlier, the uh, crows or the ravens are also attacking turtles uh, to get digging their eggs up and and um, pulling them out of the water. So they've got a lot of predators, but there's. I think the big worry is the dam. If they build the dam, all their nesting banks and areas are will be destroyed. But uh, over a period of time, they might just learn to adjust. I don't, I'm not real sure. I've also seen um, we've also seen evidence of echidnas digging up eggs and and getting like just looking for moisture. I gather and and sort of just licking, you know, destroying a couple eggs and licking the tops of them. Um, can't remember who told me that now. Might have been mate Josh, but yeah, they um, they uh, yeah, there's there's evidence of that as well. So. There's um, threats from all angles for the poor things, but they they persist. Oh yeah, water rats are real bad. I've had uh, on Fraser Island. I think I counted 18 or 19 nests, uh, which have been dug up uh, by water rats. And there's one nest that wasn't dug up. But that's only because we dis obviously disturbed it. You know. So the water rats were really bad as, as far as predators go and and that would be the same too because they're a difficult little critter to see the water rat or the water mole as some said um, they're difficult to find but that was obviously that's what was doing it down there in Fraser Island well our tortoises throughout eastern Australia are in greatly reduced numbers now uh, mainly from predators and people and agricultural changes. Um, I would say all of them, actually. I wrote an article probably 30 years ago, don't take our freshwater turtles for granted. Uh, but they sort of ignored that. In places where I've seen hundreds of dead turtles, nothing's ever done. You report the wildlife and I often think of what what has caused it. I know in one place in particular, even on the Burdigan River where I got the holo type for the Irwin's turtle, um, although they're in the Bowen River and, and, and that is better, um, where I got 
the hole they've tied from, they've made a big a big dam there now for agricultural reasons and the weed was growing and they uh, poisoned the weed and killed turtles by the droves. A mate of mine's friend went there with his dog and licked the water and died, died on the spot with this uh, poison they're using. Um, it dis disappears within so many hours. But these are sort of the problems our turtles are facing really bad right throughout eastern Australia. The numbers are down greatly. A place where Terence goes with his dad. Um, I used to dive down there early in the piece and I was marking them. I'd go and catch with uh, that great turtle man, John Good. I went with him one time. I wanted to catch them and, and mark them and I'd pick up maybe 120 within three quarters of an hour or an hour. I dive there now and I'm only catching three or four or five, hardly any at all. And the property owners don't know what's wrong either. They don't know why, what's going on. So it's hard to say what's happening to our turtle populations in Eastern Australia. Interesting. So there's some level of ambiguity and it's unknown. So maybe more of these diseases that are occurring could, could be something. And... That's right. Yeah. There's another, another place there <clears throat> where I described Gunabara from the Shilla Day, the Ambidura there. And um, a lady called me down one time and showed me hundreds of small turtles dead. Um, I photographed them and sent them to wildlife and they said they'll look into it, but they never ever did. They never ever made touch with her, you know. It could have been that um, poison of the weed, aqualine mm. is the name of it. Um, it could have been the aqualine that, well, they was, which kills the turtles. It's hard to say. Mm. Sometimes. So like, yeah. yeah. Sorry, you go. No, I would go ahead. I was, yeah. I was just going to say sometimes you see die offs and, and it's only smaller ones or only larger ones. And, you know, the virus in the Bellinger River seems to be affecting the larger turtles, but not the smaller turtles. So you might see a die off event or things like that. And it, and it could wipe out a full generation. <coughs> um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's not good. But like chemical regulations are not great, I guess, if some of those no. things are, or or they just They don't they don't really care about the, the when it I don't know. I guess they do care and then and, and, and work's done and they take samples and things, but when it when it comes to the action or, or remediating it or stopping it for the future, I don't know how much of that happens or it happens at a slow enough rate that there's a new there's a new weed killer that comes on the market and then it's not quick enough for them to test it and make sure that it's safe to use um but yeah it's hard to test for every single animal in the in the in the kingdom animal right. kingdom to see whether they're susceptible to different things so turtles might be something they just don't consider um but yeah it's hard to know right yeah it's unfortunate too, considering how much of an impact ecologically. I mean, even some of the studies that have looked at kind of turtles and processing uh, just organic matter have come out of Australia, and you see like staggering numbers. It's uh, unfortunate to hear that that uh, there's some stuff that kind of gets under the radar there. Yeah. With that sort of thing. Well, uh, one one story that would be interesting maybe to touch upon is that of the mary river turtle uh i know that you sort of played a role in dis in 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 the script well the the discovering i guess the species john maybe you can tell us what 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 is sort of the history of the mary river turtle well well i think i've wrote that up pretty well in the past <laughs> <clears throat> in fact i've my wife with back in the days too when we went around australia when i she filled me with diving with them crocodiles for those two turtles. She had also had the movie camera. That was a day on the same trip when I got back to, uh, I headed back for Sydney, uh, where I went out on the Mary River. Um, 
I was going to go to Lawn Hill and, and a, a friend of mine was camped there and he sent me uh, a photograph which turned out to be uh, a new species, but I couldn't couldn't wait to go straight back because I had a letter waiting for me from a from an old mate, John Greenhug, the man who used to trap all the turtles and or, or dig up the nests, I should say, um, and sell them in the pet trade. And um, that's when I finally uh, caught one in, in the end after their 20 odd years I hunted for that blooming turtle before I ended up catching caught one, you know. But uh, they're pretty safe now. Um, the Tyro Land Council, um, I've got all the school kids and, and all the local, the farmers, everyone protecting those Mary River turtles. They're marking the nest. They're breeding them by the hundred, hundreds and uh, releasing them back into the river. So they look pretty safe today. For a while, it looked pretty bad because my old mate John, who used to uh, sell the turtles, a couple of thousand a year season without any trouble at all, and um, that would have had a big impact over the years. Um, not that it would have even entered his head. He was just trying to make a, make a dollar for his family. But uh, I think they're pretty safe now, the Mary River turtle. Good to hear that they're safe. What, what what made it so hard about finding them in the wild? Right, they were so they were common in the pet trade, but very hard to find. What why was that? Well, I don't know. I the water was normally always dirty. The water is reasonably clear now, because there used to be sand mining upstream. And the, the silt would come up from this, getting the sand uh, from the river uh, for, for concrete in the future or whatever, um, it was always making the water dirty. And usually people who were going north to look for turtles would drive straight past the Mary River, just took it for granted and uh, never ever checked it. I know a couple of chaps had a bit of a look there. The water was too dirty and they couldn't find anything. But I persevered. I, I ended up tracking down the, uh, the chap who used to um, sell them and distribute them from Sydney to Victoria and South Australia. And um, I got through him. I sent him a copy of my uh, a small book that I wrote. And... Um, and I told him my turtles are protected. You can't buy them anymore. No one else can sell them, which was a fact. Uh, so he relented and he told me the name of uh, the old gentleman who me and him was good friends with in the end. Uh, he was a bit foxy for a while. He sent me away out to Western Queensland, told me where he got them from, but he didn't get it from there at all. And, uh, I ended up finally getting through to him and he's, he relented um, and, and told me where they were. So, And I still thought he was telling lies, but of course he said, oh, come and I'll show you where the uh, eggs are. They'll be there now. So we went out onto the Mary River and he dug and he dug and, and I was saying two and two don't come to the four because... Uh, when we was there in October, um, or September, I should say, the turtles wouldn't be nesting then if they all hatched at Christmas, just before Christmas Day, for people to sell them. So I said, I knew he's lying. <laughs> uh, and I, uh, never, I couldn't find them. So I went back three months, uh, a month later, and sure enough, on spec, found them, yeah. And those yeah. were adults, or yeah, or the, and okay. The first one I got, my wife had a film there, and I, I spotted one. I put a hide up. He got back in the water, so I put a hide up <clears throat> with a tar pole and everything. And then the wife went down there, and sure enough, this big monstrous turtle I'd never seen one before um, of size. Uh, were sitting on the log, two of them, 
come up on the log and we got film of it. Uh, the first ones ever. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that's got to be a good feeling. Yeah, that was great. Searching. The right. hunt was there. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, uh, yeah, they're really interesting turtles. I haven't seen, I think I've seen some, some skulls uh, that, that Dr. Pritchard had, but not, and, and fragments, but haven't seen them anywhere here. Yeah. They're not, they don't seem to, well, actually, no, <laughs> there are two live ones in the turtle conservancy now that we did see, but, uh, yeah, before that, I hadn't seen it. Where'd you say the live ones are? The the Turtle Conservancy in uh, California has two live ones, uh, the Eleuser. I don't know. Oh. I don't know, Jack, if you heard where they came from. I don't know what the story was behind them. Uh, uh, I just know that they're both like, they look younger. <clears throat> they're not, they're not full grown. So I don't think they, I don't think they've had them super long. So. I'd take a punt and say I sent a pair uh, legally um, with permits from the government to send them to uh, Baltimore Aquarium, Jack Johnson Jacket, and they had them breeding straight away. Uh, so maybe that's where they've been set elsewhere in the past. I don't know. Hmm, yeah, we we spoke with him actually on uh, one of the previous episodes, and he was telling yeah. us about yeah, he had some really interesting things that that he was doing, uh, really successful. It sounds like with his breeding program there. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, have you been well, in contact? Not much. Not too much. Not too much. Yeah. Uh, he's a good bloke. Good friends. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And that, uh, one of the other things that well, we were talking to uh, Craig Adler on on a previous podcast, and he told he was one of his he had like a trivia question for us, and it was about the uh, Sudemidura and uh, something interesting about their nesting ecology. And I think that you actually were the one who sort of described this behavior. Uh, but what the what what kind of work have you done with the Western Swamp? I guess tortoises uh, and and. That that's a really interesting animal. No, I've had <clears throat> nothing to do with the Western Swamp Turtle in any way at all. I've never had one. I've seen one. I've been with Gerald um, out to the dam and the lagoon where they were, and uh, we were he was tracking them, and he caught actually a small one while we were there walking through the swamp. But uh, they're breeding them quite successfully in captivity in a couple of different locations now. <clears throat> so they they look like they're out of danger again. So that's good. How do they nest? They nest. Uh, well, it's interesting too because they they uh, when they nest, they dig with their front claws, and um, <clears throat> I never knew this at the time. And when the wife and myself in 1919, uh, 90, were traveling around Australia, we come into a camp called Bells Creek. And there's a couple of other people there and a man and a lady come over and joined us around our fire. And we had a yarn and started talking turtles because I was catching turtles to photograph. And, and um, she said, oh, she caught a, a short neck turtle crossing a road. And, uh, I said, oh, yeah, where at, Bullsbrook Way? She said, oh, no, 100, 100 kilometres or 100 miles, whatever she said, north of there. Um, I said, gee, that's interesting. And what did you do with it? She said, oh, we put it in a pond. And uh, I thought about that. And, and I said, what happened to it? She said, well, it disappeared because we never had a fence around it. But I, used to, I watched it one day nesting. And it was at water's level, just above water level, and it was digging with its front feet into the into a hole in, in the bank and crawled in there. I lost interest straight away because I reckon she was, I was joking. Of, of course, turtles don't use their front legs to nest, I thought. 
anyway, down the track, I mentioned the uh, Gerald Cookling. He said, yes, that's how they nest. They dig with their front feet. They dig a hole. They do their nesting. Anyway, I never even... She did tell me an address or a mark on a map and I scrubbed it years ago, you know, thinking I was exaggerating to say that. But this was about 100, whatever, miles or kilometres up to the, uh, up from the river where they, where they found in the creeks. Hmm. Uh, so they may have more of an extensive distribution than... Well, I... Gerald looked into it and he couldn't find out anything, you know, Gerald Cookling about it, you know. He said, oh, they're not up there, but here's a man and a woman who was genuine what they said and tell them the truth. And I sort of said, well, they're making that story up, so I ignored it, really talked something else. Yeah, you hear right. all the stories, yeah. Well, that, yeah, that's, that's interesting that it was that was something that was uh that that you figured out but you you know you thought it was a, j a joke and then maybe actually some other discoveries waiting sort of yeah, within that that's right yeah yeah well i mean we're starting to come up on time here but maybe we have a few more things we can ask i i'm curious oh, yeah. out of all the trips you've been on and, and adventures you've taken what was the one that stands out the most and why well, the trip to traveling around Australia was the most interesting trip I ever did with my wife. <clears throat> we camped for, for, for many, many months, three months, over three months. We did thousands of kilometers or miles. And um, I ended up finding a few different new species of turtles on this one trip. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't have invented that, you know. There was, you know, there was the dentata, the new, I reckon there's a new dentata out there. The West, they reckon it's the same turtle, I don't. Morphologically, it's very different. I've seen no genetics done on it. But um, morphologically, it's different. Um, I think if an animal is 100% isolated, and um, I think... It can still be a species or a subspecies, irrespective of what genetic size. It looks different. It is different. But genetically, they're very similar. But I don't even know what the genetics are, so even at this stage, you know. But the other ones was very interesting. So any, any trip away is good. If you like diving, you enjoy it, you're going to find turtles. But to find, to find a few new species on one trip is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I found a few on the one trip. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I, should yeah. Have had, I, should have, I should have got another one, but I had to race, race right back to the Mary River when there was a letter waiting for me. I've got your one. The old fox, he said, here's your turtle. This is the one you wanted. He had it in a, in a drum. And he opened it up and he pulled out a different turtle all together. He tricked me. <laughs> I nearly died. That that's not a Mary River turtle or whatever you're calling it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, penny turtle. Yeah. And it was. He said, well, try this one here. <laughs> yeah. John Greenhog. Yeah. Great yeah, guy. it sounds like uh, that he was not maybe the most trustworthy person, but uh, yeah. he eventually got there. But, well, that that's interesting. I mean, one trip and multiple different species of turtles is something that's that's pretty interesting. Now, I met, that was in the Northern Territory then with the Dentata. No, that was that was in Western Australia. That big snapper. Okay. <clears throat> and the other one I brought back was Tenny Bahaga. It was a new one as well, uh, and the Mary River turtle. Do Do you know and, much about this? And on the same trip back, I got the uh, other one back. I got the Belgian River one also. Yeah. Do you the uh, have you actually seen the Cooklings long neck in in C two? Cooklings, Cooklings long neck. Oh, Cooklings. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, no, I've never seen one of those. We tried to find them. I 
I went out there looking for them, but uh, we never found them. But uh, there was some genetics done um, for me, and uh, it turned out that they were different. But uh, they all, all always queried me in the book where I got the 16% difference. Well, the man that done the genetics for me was the top man in the world. There's no doubt about that. He was the first man to do um, genetics with formaldehyde, formalin. <coughs> and um, later on, well, they got more advanced with their genetics. It was 6%. So we're, I never, ever found one. I've, I've been to the area where the original one came from, but I think they've been... Uh, Whatever's happened to them, I don't know now. Gerald seems to think they still could exist in a in a location that the crocodiles destroyed my my traps, and they destroyed his traps too. Um, so with a bit of luck and the right traps and a bit of luck, uh, we hope cooklings still could exist, but it could be very much extinct. Hmm. Yeah. It was a genuine turtle. Right. Yeah. You mentioned kind of Western, uh, Western Australia, the Northern area, that kind of, I, I thought yeah. of that, but inter yeah. yeah, interesting turtle. How about yeah. like w one piece of advice that you would give to someone looking to make herpetology or turtles somewhat of a career? I don't know. How do you mean? Any, any advice for people who want to do herpetology as a career or, or choose well, that as a career Well, it's, it's not, it's it'd be a, if you want to go to university and if you're blessed enough to get someone to uh, finance you to, to do some research, yes, that's, that's great. But otherwise, with me, it was just a hobby and um, I kept, kept at it, that's all. So someone like uh, Terence here and, and a few other friends of mine, um, it's a hobby with them. They've got to make their own money uh, to do trips and spend some time. And, and uh, I know a, a lot of, like, I know some very interesting locations where there are still turtles, I reckon, that couldn't, could be yet to be described. But um, I've kept it to myself. I know a few places in particular. I mentioned a couple of them in my book. I said um, an undisclosed location when I put photographs of them. Uh, people wanted to, people, the wrong people have asked me, where's the un, undisclosed location at? Well, I won't tell them. I said, I forgot. <laughs> well, no, never, no, no. Andrew's never asked me, or his, his father hasn't, or Terence. Yeah. Yeah. Scared well, that's like not telling me. <laughs> huh. yeah. I have a question about the, the the habitat on Fraser Island. Are uh, is there visibility in the lake there, or do you have to catch the turtles there? That's what. Is there much visibility in the lakes and stuff in Fraser Island? Oh. What's the habitat like there? Oh yeah, Fraser Island. There is one place where the water is very dirty, uh, up in the sand dunes, but over there, it's crystal clear water, clearest water you've ever dived in. It's very enjoyable. they got an expanse of their broad shell. They're down in numbers. People have been taking a few out, I think, for pets or what, I don't know. Uh, the last couple of times, or well, the last time I went down there, I only seen one or two. Um, but they're never in big numbers, but... The, uh, the uh, Niger, the small one, they're in very common numbers in a few lagoons. And if you ever you're there, it's a very enjoyable dive. It's beautiful. The water's crystal clear. Very clear water. Yeah. 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 Awesome. What, what's the reasoning behind some of the, the, the Macquarie there get darker and maybe even the, the Expansa? Why is that? Is that an adaptation to getting? Do you have any kind of theories? 
<laughs> why they why they're so black the nigra why are they blacker than all i the don't others? know it's it's always made me ask that question to myself because the water's so clear the sand is crystal clear <coughs> so i wonder wonder why they've evolved that way <coughs> i don't know not but uh it's not colder there is it like it's it's what's what's that what's the climate like in that region oh the water's warm it's very comfortable water it might get a bit cold in the winter but it would never get down really cold it's always warm water it's always always diveable summer and winter so it's hard to say why they went black mm -hmm. it's interesting one of the uh theory or hypotheses behind sliders why in the u.s the trachemies they get darker uh, is that it's some secondary kind of byproduct of hormonal changes as they get older and there might not be any sort of functional significance to it it's it doesn't seem like it's really well supported it's kind of just like your uh i don't know maybe kind of a null hypothesis and in, in absence of other sort of data i guess but maybe something going on there right i don't know if anyone has studied that but Perhaps it's just kind of a random mutation. Well, it's hard to say a lot of things with turtles. Like one that's always bugged me is about the buff headedness we get on our lot of our turtles. Our big females get a big buff head. <coughs> and um, why does it get a buff head? And everyone that says it's so as that they can break their crustaceans up and have a big strong head. Well, this is this is wrong. Um, I think it's something they don't want to get. They're a female for whatever reason. I think it's a, I don't know what the answer to is, but it's got nothing to do with strong jaws because when the jaws are heads big, they have trouble even really big. I've had, I've seen them having trouble even chewing grass or weed um, with their mouth, hardly open their mouth to feed. So that wouldn't be that. And the reason they, they, they a lot of them do eat crustaceans it was like uh the illusa the mary river one which i found out which used to uh i put mussels in there because one passed a mussel in a drum one day some broken up mussels so i put a mussel in there one day when i had my first one and i brought it home the type and um i went down there one day and here he is holding it by the uh, feet and it's chewing the edge of the muscle and just snapping the very edge of the muscle off the last tapered edge and then a little bit more a little bit more and then a bit of a meat shows and he pulls the meat out and they open up and that's how they break their um, eggs up so i don't doubt the short neck with a buff head will be doing the same thing but it, um I don't know the reason. I don't believe it's for breaking crustaceans. This wouldn't be true. I don't know why I've always said that, but uh, they just take it for granted. In fact, I shouldn't say it, but he's passed now. I would never have said it. Um, a good mate of mine at the time for a while, sort of, John Legler. He, he, uh, he made a documentary one time. He might, you might have seen it, where he... Uh, was watching a big snapper breaking the eggs open breaking the uh, shell open the mussel shell and i said he couldn't open a mussel shell like that john he said no he said but keep it to yourself he said i used a pair of bolly pliers he cracked the shell <laughs> with his multi grips oh really <laughs> yeah so he's a fake artist too uh, yeah yeah good turtle man but a fake artist <laughs> yeah has there been any like uh like di like di dietary studies on uh we could see what some of those uh at least some of those endura that get those massive heads at least what they're what they're eating if there's anything to support that one hypothesis that, oh they're they're pressing up mollusks is that is there anything really been done to prove that with them or is it just uh 
has anyone ever proven that 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 crushing them that has there been a food study to see whether crushing the mollusks and eating them has contributed to that big head or is it or is it just no i i don't think they have i do know i've got a i've still got a jar in my study downstairs there um with a jar full of eggs uh shells which the female eats that was Irwin's turtle uh, was eating the little black I mentioned it in the book little black mussels uh, little black shells swallowing them whole I don't know how those they weren't even breaking them up but um, they always said it's for 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 um, breaking the shells over and I don't believe that because the Mary River turtles, I said, was just snipping away at the edges to open it up. And one girl or one of the students, uh, she contradicted me on that saying, you're wrong, you know. And then another one um, caught turtles uh, in a trap. And when they passed their food, uh, they had shells in their muscle shells, you know. So they obviously... It wasn't just an accident. Yeah. My one that I filmed or never filmed, I looked at him in my back tank, um, was feeding on, you know. So you, so you think that that growth is, is they don't want that no, growth? No, I don't. It's just I think a it's secondary a, effect. I think it's a, dis, a disadvantage to them. Right. I really do. Because when they get real big, they can't open their mouth hardly. Mm. Their, their jaws just, are that puffed, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Right. And do you yeah. think, where do you think that's coming from? Could it be? I don't know, mate. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. It's, whether it's, well, I, I, it's not an advantage to the turtle. Yeah, that's it. Because yeah. they're, they're really, a short necked turtle like that or that, well, you don't know. But they, they, they're a weed eater. Yeah. They love weeds. Yeah. They, Valsinaria and yeah. other weeds, you know. Yeah, yeah. Why do they want to try to Crush break them. open a muscle? It's difficult, mm, you know. I've exactly. seen it happen. Yeah. It's difficult to happen, and uh, I think it's a disadvantage to the turtle to get a big buff head. I always like I always like that term. For, I mean, I'm, we don't have anything like that over here. We would just say like megacephalus. Or, uh, we don't call them buff head in this or anything. That's there's a buff head. You yeah. should bring take the term over to the US. Buff head. <laughs> I, I like that idea. Yeah. <laughs> Jack Thompson, why do I have trouble talking to you? Just speaking American? <laughs> I got an old mate of mine. I don't tell him now. Jack Thompson in Australia. He's a great actor. Whenever you see any of his movies, you ought to look them. Look up Jack Thompson's movies, Australia. The great actor. I think I might have looked my name up once online, and that's who came up. So I think I, I a while ago. So okay, <laughs> yeah. he's familiar with them. Well, I think we're coming up on time here. We'd like to keep it within an hour and thirty, but um, I mean, well, actually, before we go here, um, we do a little like a round of turtle trivia at the end just for fun to bring in like really obscure turtle facts uh john i don't know if you've got a few random turtle trivia questions that you want to hit us with uh but something about australian things that they won't know <laughs> ah. Let's test them you, do you know why turtles eat mussels <laughs> I mean it, it the the calcium level in mussels is good for eggshell production, but there's probably other good nutrients, I would imagine. Just in terms yeah, of I that mentioned that could be a possibility, but what a what a disadvantage it is for the animal. Yeah. I, I would right. think yeah. the only time it would be like advantageous is if the like mollusks or whatever are just so abundant that it would make sense to feed on them. But that, that like, then, yeah, with a head like that, it's difficult to feed on anything else. Like, it, it, just, it just makes life for the turtle really uh, problematic because it's, so it's just kind of in the way. And, and it yeah. Really but, yeah. 
it's almost like uncontrolled too. So at a certain point it's advantage, but at a certain point it becomes a disadvantage, right? You're saying it's kind of uncontrolled growth, maybe. It's very hard to say what the truth story is. Right. What's that? What about what about the America? Do you use do you have many that dry out completely throughout the uh, summer months with no water and bury in the dampness and is that common with American turtles like Australian ones? <coughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's it's difficult to make a comparison between American and Australian turtles. It's different, but yes, there are some. Uh, like mud mud turtles, they'll uh, they'll often live in temporary wetlands that dry out completely for part of the year. Uh, they'll have they're capable of excavating for sometimes years on end. But that, that's normally just mud. But uh, there's also a lot of permanent rivers in the southeast, and most of the larger turtles are in those habitats that they yeah. don't have to worry about uh, the water uh, suddenly drying up or anything like that. Some yeah, well, there's no doubt that the Steindachnus turtles dry out for probably a few years. They uh, try to dig into the roots of trees and and branches and and, and 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 the roots where there's dampness dig in a long way and they just go to sleep there for a couple of years or three years before water comes again you know and then they come out but uh they can do it for a long time i remember um some scientist of types he uh was curious about this himself and what he did I think it was a terrible act we did, is putting turtles in an incubator real hot for a long period of time to see how effective it was. I reckon he should have been jail. It was nearly killing them. And uh, fancy doing that into a heat chamber just to see how long they can last without water. That was a paper that I read years ago. Yeah. Huh. What? Do you yeah, guys have yeah. any, any trivia, any quiz question? Uh, I mean, no, we kind of leave that to the, the guests to go on us, but uh, no, we, yeah, we haven't done so much, but I don't know if you've got any other questions, uh, but we can, or we can wrap things up, whichever. Uh, but uh, yeah, maybe we, we start to wrap things up, but uh really appreciate you coming on john and terrence today um i i've definitely learned a lot i think i speak for the other guys here but. god that's good even i have <laughs> no it's and been uh, you ken you haven't said much have you <laughs> i have not no i i don't know much about australian turtles to be to admit it it's done. okay <laughs> Ken is absorbing this information, and uh, he's he's more of a salamander lizard guy, but we've turned him yeah. into a turtle person. Right. We've converted him. But... That's good. Uh, yeah. I okay, definitely yeah. learned a lot. This was a great conversation. Even though about half the time I was uh, getting my wife out for cutting me off of it, and so I managed to come back on. But, so. Well, it's yeah. yeah, it's been great to see you again, Terrence, and to to meet you and and talk with you today, John. Thanks for coming on and uh, telling us stories and and talking turtles with us. Uh, for all of our listeners, you can find us at theturtleroom.org/slash/coloniacast. You can access our student research fund there, uh, and we will see you on the next ColoniaCast episode. Thanks.